who was active in the nuclear freeze movement in the 1980s? OK, we were. Um, and many people, maybe when they were growing up, were aware of the nuclear arms race. And a lot of us got our, our education, especially in the 1980s. And so my goal here is to, um, to update that to nowadays, where, where does the nuclear arms race stand nowadays, so that you know, we understand what the different kinds of weapons are, not too nitty gritty, but just in general, and what the debates are now uh, in order to get engaged again in the, in the struggle against nuclear weapons. Um, I will start by saying just two things. No, actually one thing that, that we're doing in New Hampshire that is similar is that in, in New Hampshire, we have seven towns and cities that have passed what's called the Back from the Brink resolution. And so um, it is, I believe, well, it's five steps that would lead up to a ban of nuclear weapons. So starting with some very concrete steps and, and, and uh, leading up to it. And it's uh, one of its biggest proponents is the uh, International Physicians for um, Prevention of Nuclear War. And we saw Ira Helfand there in the movie. He's been very active. He does travel, travel so I'm sure, he, he, I, I'm sure he's been up here to Maine and would come again. Um, anyway, so I'm part of, an, of, of a group in, um, we're centered in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, co-sponsored by uh, New Hampshire Peace Action and the American Friends Service Committee uh, of New Hampshire. And we collaborate with other groups, including Seacoast Peace Action. What we're busy doing right now is uh, trying to get after uh, presidential candidates and get them to take a stand on nuclear weapons. So we're busy bird dogging, and we would invite anybody to come down and join us. Um, so that's just um, a little bit of of where we're coming from this year. But uh, let's just look at um, where the nuclear arsenal is now. This is from the March uh, after the nuclear, um, the Nonproliferation Treaty um, conference in 2015. So it's a march in New York City. A number of us were there. Um, so the goal is to update from the 1980s. Uh, anybody recognize that scene? Yeah, it's, that's the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Uh, and it's uh, emblematic of the end of the Cold War. Uh, the Cold War had been going on for those of us alive then for most of our lives. And we grew up under the shadow of the fear or maybe the certainty that our lives would end in a nuclear war. It's hard to over, overstate how much it shadowed our lives. Um, and then, for many reasons, the Cold War ended, and we are, the US and the Soviet Union, then Russia, signed a series of nuclear arms reduction treaties. And it looked like, or we were told, I'm not sure I believed it, but we were told and accepted at the time that nuclear weapons would never threaten us again in the way that they had during the Cold War. And um, because they were so awful to think about, we wanted to believe it. But here we are 30, almost 30 years, la 30 years later, and we've still got the things. I, so I want to show how we got from here to there. Um, you saw this in the film. And how does this work? Ah, OK. So mid-1980s was the peak year for the possession of uh, nuclear warheads. And you see that um, almost all of them were possessed by the US and Russia, although China, France, and the UK also possessed a few nuclear weapons. And you can see why we were all became so hopeful uh, in the mid-80s when we started to dis um, signed these treaties, and the US and Russia uh, started to uh, on, the pa on a real serious path of nuclear disarmament. Um, and we did get rid of about 85% of our nuclear warheads. It was about seven, 17,000 nuclear warheads in existence in the 80s. And it's way down. It's a, 
we're at about 15,000 15, nowadays. Okay, that's, that's also the problem. Um, here we are nowadays, um, and it looks a lot better, but you know, what can we see there? Um, yeah, it's, it's leveled off, and it's still plenty to end life on Earth. And there, as, as we saw in the film, there have been plenty of near misses on that. So that, that's the problem. We got, we, a lot of us relaxed, said um, the problem's over, started focusing on other things, and yet we still have a huge, horrifying danger. Um, any, anyone care to answer this? Obama. Obama, yeah. Um, oh, it was under President Obama that we began the current generation of upgrades and replacement of our entire nuclear arsenal. So one thing that um, we need to remember is this is not a Democratic or Republican issue. Uh, the Democrats are very, especially mainstream Democrats, are very complicit in maintaining the current nuclear standoff. I, I don't know Maine politics, but our Senator Gene Shaheen is very much a cold warrior. Um, so with that reminder. But here you practically have to be in the pocket of, of Fat Byron. Oh, to be oh, OK. Right, right, and I saw the conversion brochure there. I want to take that home. We have, in New Hampshire, we have a lot of uh, corporations that are military contractors, and we have, of course, the Portsmouth Navy shipyard, which I know is in Maine, but New Hampshire still thinks it belongs to New Hampshire. <laughs> but anyway, there are, there are a whole lot of New Hampshire people who work there. So it's, um, and so our New Hampshire senators have to defend that, and we have a BAE, a major uh, corporation, and a lot of small electronics uh, subcontractors for the Pentagon. So anyway, um, th this is the question that, I don't know if you remember, Donald Trump couldn't under answer the question of what the nuclear triad was during the, the 2016 debates. So what is the nuclear triad? Um, it, it's the three-legged or three-sided um, deployment of our nuclear warheads, uh, 400 and land-based missiles in silos in Montana, uh, North Dakota, and Wyoming, uh, 900 in nuclear submarines, and 300 on bombers, uh, B-2 and B-52 bombers. Some of them are no longer gravity bo bombs, it also includes air launch cruise missiles. So stop me anytime you would like clarification or expansion. But that's, that, that's what the triad is. That's what the triad is. Um, and you will see it doesn't add up to the, um, the 6,000 nuclear weapons that the US has in its arsenal. And that's because this is maybe a third of them. We have some in storage ready to be used. And we also have a number of retired nuclear weapons, um, which are supposed to be dismantled. But one reason we're not dismantling it, them is because the, uh, the Pantex um, factory in Texas, which is where they would dismantle them, is too busy building new ones. Yeah. So um, it's, it's tragic. Here's another view of nuclear weapons today. You can see that by far the majority are held by Russia and the US, functionally equivalent numbers, and now um, subject to limits of the New START Treaty, which is the, street, the treaty that will expire a couple weeks after um, the, the next president is inaugurated in 2021. So um, we can see that it's the US and Russia that present by far the greatest danger. Um, we have 
that's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, vast destructive power. And I left out of this slideshow because we, you know, we wanted to be economical in time, any overview of how horrible a nuclear war would be. I assume you are familiar with that. Um, just quickly, they showed a lot in the film, but not only uh, the destructive power of those horrible weapons on hundreds of cities if we had a full exchange, but it's been pretty well proven nowadays that nuclear winter as a result of a large nuclear exchange would pretty much destroy life on Earth, at least anything that had to eat. I guess that would be about everybody. Um, anyway. Uh, would, would pretty much do an end to us because uh, there would be uh, temperatures as a result of the explosion and the, um, the smoke in the atmosphere. Sunlight would be blocked out for a number of years and we would have temperatures down to ice age temperatures for a number of years in a row so that um, people would starve to death. It would be impossible to produce food. So that's nuclear winter, and we're learning more and more about that. Still a danger, in addition to the, the everything that we saw in that in that film. Um, one thing you'll hear about if you start to get into this issue is the is the phrase nuclear modernization. What does that mean? Um, nuclear modernization means that we are. We, the Pentagon is replacing every leg of that triad. We are, re, we are building an entire new generation of submarines. Um, we are building a, of nuclear submarines. We are building an entire new generation of bombers. The new one is called the B-21. Um, and we are... Um, designing an entire new generation of land-based missiles. Um, so that's the delivery vehicles and uh, a, a big redesign of the warheads in addition. And that, that whole program is called nuclear modernization. Um, vastly expensive. Uh, has anybody heard how much that's going to cost? It's a number that's been around for a while. 1.7 Yeah, the estimates are up to $1.7 trillion over 30 years that that would cost. That is the program that was begun under Barack Obama. Uh, you know, there's, he was in some ways pressured into it, um, it into uh, allowing this modernization program to go forward because he wanted the New START Treaty to get through of the Senate, and that was sort of the price of it. But there are also people in the, in the Obama administration that are in love with nuclear modernization. So uh, we'll hear about that. And we, we're, at, we're trying to ask candidates in New Hampshire, are you, will you oppose this? Um, so there it is, nuclear modernization. That's, a, that's an old slide. We, we could update. I, I guess the official estimate now is 1.2 trillion, but places like um, the Watson Institute at Brown University say no, it's, it, it's 1.7 trillion. So as we said, missiles, bombers, submarines, and warheads. They talked in the film about near misses with nuclear weapons. And this has to do with the land-based land missiles in the, in the upper Midwest. And they still are maintained on what some people call hair trigger alert. Some people don't like that term, so they call it prompt launch. But however you say it, the situation is that those world-destroying missiles can be launched within just a few minutes, certainly no more than a half an hour, but probably a lot less of receiving a presidential order. There's debate about whether that can be done on the sole authority of the president, but there's a lot of evidence that it can. Um, so those incidents, I don't, I don't know if I have a slide about it, but where there have been numerous incidents where because of radar glitches or human stupidity or whatever, um, one side or the other has thought that they saw incoming incoming nuclear missiles 
or bombers and came very, very close. In fact, started to ready the, go through the steps of launching, launching those missiles. It, it's terrifying. Um, one of the most recent incidents is when they did lose um, one of the, the missile groups in the Midwest lost uh, computer communications with a whole cluster of silos for, I can't remember how, how long it was, but it was a significant period of time. Um, the thought was, and then they restored it, and we didn't all die, but the thought was that that might have been a hacking attack. Uh, it was not, but that's certainly the fear that that's the sort of thing that can start to happen as the hackers get better and better. So that's, that's why there is so much fright about hair trigger alert and why some of the proposals short of nuclear um, the ban treaty have to do with doing away with hair trigger alert or even with doing away with those land-based missiles entirely and a number of retired generals are uh, like that idea, including Mattis for a while. One thing that they didn't mention in the film was that the missile crews, um, the airmen and women that control those missile silos have had a lot of problems with drugs and cheating and so on. Okay. Talked about that. There are big scandals about the preparation of the missile crews. Um, there's, there's certainly a fear of terrorism and, and nuclear missiles getting into the hands of <laughs> terrorist groups. I don't, that's, that's a funny, it feels funny to use that term terrorist for small groups of armed people in other countries because our national policy is certainly nuclear terrorism. But, um, so, just, oh, wait, let me go back. Can anybody name the nine nations now that have nuclear weapons? Let's see if we can go. We've got, we know the U.S. and Russia. And France. And France. And Israel. Israel, yeah. The, the, the five permanent members. The five permanent members. Uh, U.S., U.K., France, Russia, China. China. Yeah, okay. The, yeah, and those are the ones that are officially in, entitled to have nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Okay, and you said Israel, although it doesn't admit India it. India, India. Pakistan. And? and? North, Korea. North Korea. Okay. Okay. So those are the, the outlines of the, of the current situation. Um, and I just want to conclude this by talking a little bit under, so what, this was true under um, Barack Obama, and it was true under George Bush and, and Clinton, the, these, these sorts of things. But what does Trump big, uh, bring to it? And, and I think we all understand here that Trump didn't start this. Um, but what, how has he worsened the situation? In, the, um, in 2018, um, the Trump administration issued its nuclear posture review. And two new things. Um, one is that they proposed some new nuclear weapons, and these are what is called smaller, flexible nuclear weapons. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a future slide. But also added new, new reasons for nuclear weapons strikes, why we might do, for instance, a first strike. And does anybody remember what was added? Okay. Uh, there were some new circumstances, and one of them included um, cyber attack. I believe there were some other circumstances where if that the, U, the U.S. would said that it would be willing to do a first nuclear strike. And so it added some reasons. The primary one was cyber attack. I think it added some others. So yeah, new, new reasons. One of the things in the new nuclear posture review was uh, flexible or small nuclear weapons. Um, anybody familiar with that or what that's all about? There's a, the weapons, that it's sort of clear what they would be. They, they're smaller kilotonnage, smaller power, uh, still terribly deadly, but, you know, just a little nuke. 
Um, easier to move around. Easier to move around. And, but the other thing is there, the belief is that these are, are being proposed by both our militaries, the US and Russia, because they think maybe they can get away with using them. Um, it's just a little nuclear weapon. Maybe we can, we would never dare, public opinion would never allow us to, uh, to launch a, a huge exchange and it would end the world. And even crazy people know that, or a lot of them do. But how about, you know, six kilotons? Um, how about a small nuclear weapon? And, and the, the theory is that it's called, there's a lot of crazy nuclear theories, but one of them is called escalate to de-escalate. And that means in a crisis in which conventional weapons are being used, if one side or the other, and both the US and Russia are toying with this, if one side set, uh, ups the ante and uses some small nuclear weapons, you know, maybe they, this is in parentheses, just kill a few hundred thousand people, but they show that they're willing to use nuclear weapons, then the other side, but just a small one, we're not going to start a global war, then the other side might back off. And that's the justification. And the US says that the Russians started this, so we're just going to follow where they lead. Um, but obviously, that's the justification. But what's the huge fear about that, in addition to the fact that it would be in itself a crime against humanity? What happens next? The bigger ones. Yeah, the bigger ones. We go to the big ones. Yeah. And you know, one question is, if you see, if you're Russia and you see a missile coming in, how on earth do you know how big it is? when you see them coming in, you know, there's, and even after the impact in all the chaos, I, I think it would be pretty hard to say, oh, it was only a small, it was only a small nuclear weapon. Uh, of course, escalation is, is going to be a real danger. But that, but anyway, um, this is very, um, a topic very much talked about in nuclear armaments today. And I think I'm, quite close to the end here. So the last, the, I, one of the last things I want to talk about is that under Trump, but it started under uh, George W. Bush in 2002, we've been canceling treaty after treaty after treaty. So George, the second George Bush canceled the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which was terrible. We pulled out of it in 2002, and a lot of people, and the Russians say that that is what led to their new round of escalation. Um, and we know that we pulled out of the Iran Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. So these treaties are just falling like dominoes. The last major treaty in existence, the last one standing, is the New START Treaty. Uh, which was signed in 2010 by um, Obama and then the, the then president of, of Russia. Um, it expires in 2021 if it is not renewed. The good news is it could be renewed. You don't have to get it through the Senate or the Duma or anything. It can be renewed for five years simply by agreement of the two president, uh, the presidents of the two countries. Uh, early in I think in their first conversation, uh, when Trump became president, um, Putin, for all his flaws and dangers, asked um, Trump if he would be interested in, re you know, how about we renew this treaty? And Trump turned him down. Um, and it looks like it's going to be really, really hard as the as the date approaches for this treaty to to continue. But if this treaty falls, we will have no significant nuclear weapons control treaties between the US and Russia for the first time in 50 years, I believe. It, 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 certainly the first time since in the middle of the Cold War. Um, so that's, that's what is so frightening about what's happening now.
I guess we're done. I mean, the two things I think about are, um, one, it's way more expensive than other ways of generating electricity. So you could have a whole lot of wind turbines and, and, and photovoltaics for the, you know, per, per kilowatt hour, way more per dollar than you could with a nu nuclear plants. And the other thing is, that, as, as we all know, it, leads, it, it, it keeps the door open to proliferation. So I, I, it's getting harder to do, I think, partly because AFSC taught so many people to do it. Uh, so, so more people are doing bird dogging. But one thing, but you, there are certainly candidates around, and some people are getting questions in. But the other thing is they, there's a new, a new thing called the selfie line. Is, What's that? And Elizabeth Warren is doing it, but I've seen a lot of other candidates do it too. Uh, like clo a lot of candidates do it. They will, after they give their speech and take a limited number of questions, they will stand around and a line of people goes through to shake their hand and get a picture taken. Um, you know, a, a staff person holds that person's cell phone and takes a photo. So, you know, you get your souvenir. And I always thought it was fairly stupid, but um, anyway, it's called a selfie line. But when, then we realized that you can have a 30-second conversation with someone who might be president during that, during that interchange. It's got to be quick. Sometimes they'll stop and talk some more. I mean, that happens a lot. But you have to be sort of have something pretty, you know, like a one-sentence thing to say I really care about shifting money from the Pentagon to, anyway. Uh, but you can talk to them in that line. Mm -hmm. And that's almost a guaranteed chance that they, they will listen to you. And if enough people do that, and we just go through as, you know, like Susie Citizen, I don't try to come out across like an, an expert in a situation like that, they, they're gonna start to think, you know, I think New Hampshire people, even if they're from Maine, <laughs> I care about, you know, that the voters care about this issue, and I better start having a policy and maybe bringing it up. Um, so um, if anybody wants to give me their email, we have, um, I can send you um, access to uh, the calendar so you can see who's coming around. And a lot of people come to Portsmouth and Exeter and Rochester, which, what is it? An hour from here, hour and a half from here? Yeah, so go down to Portsmouth and have dinner and, you know, talk to a candidate. It, no, I think it's, it's really important to do. Would you also have some specific questions one would ask? Yeah, good question. I think that would be good. Yeah, I mean, think yeah. about it ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be very helpful because, you know, you, yeah. for instance, you and your group may know exactly, you know, yeah. things that a candidate might respond to uh -huh. and because you want to also give the impression that you know something yeah. about the topic. So no, you're not just asking willy-nilly. Yeah. You're really looking at yeah. a serious response. Yeah, yeah. And there are different tactics for different times. Yeah, sure. And certainly you want to try and get recognized from the floor. Yeah. And, and that could be a more, you know, that's somewhat more detailed question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what's your quick question for the renewal of the START Treaty and those small, little, ugly nuclear weapons. The flexible? Oh. What would you ask for either one of those? Um, well, would you, would, you, would you renew the START Treaty? You know, uh, you know the START Treaty is going to expire in 2021. Will you renew it? Yeah. And um, are you opposed to the proposals for new flexible nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. But um, 